unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant the Masha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. These days, the world of Indian politics and policy appears to be moving at warp speed, even by Indian standards. To make sense of all of the latest developments, I am pleased to welcome back our Grant the Masha podcast regular, Sadhanand Dume of AEI and the Wall Street Journal, and Tanvi Madan of the Brookings Institutions. Sadhanand Tanvi, welcome back. Good to be back. It is great to be back, Milan. So this week on the show, we are going to discuss three topics. First, we'll look at the latest drama coming out of the Indian National Congress and discuss the race to take over India's grand old party. Next, we will turn to External Affairs Minister S. J. Shankar's lengthy visit to the United States. We'll discuss the key takeaways and controversies from his trip. And last but not least, we are seeing creeping warning signs of religious polarization of all kinds uh, within the Indian diaspora, stretching from Canada to the UK to the US. We'll talk about what it all means. But let us start first with the latest from the Congress party. Uh, for the first time in many years, we will have an open contest to decide who will become the next Congress party president. In the end, there are only two candidates. In one corner, we have Lok Sabha MP from Kerala, noted author Shashi Tharoor. And in the other, we have veteran Congress politician from Karnataka, Malik Arjun Karge. Uh, Sadhanand, let me, let me start with you. Tell us about who these two candidates are and who do you think is likely to merge victorious when the party actually goes to vote on the 17th of October? So very quickly, um, Shashi Tharoor is probably the candidate who is better known to many people outside India. He was a, He's an author. He's a former diplomat, uh, worked at the UN for many years before returning to India and joining electoral politics. Um, at this point, he's a three-time MP from the southern state of Kerala, from Thiruvananthapuram. And uh, he's known for his extensive vocabulary, and he's um, uh, urbane, uh, witty, and so on. Now, so he is one candidate. And the other, Kharge, is really one of those figures who wasn't that well known until relatively recently, until the past, past few years. He made his, he, he was in, active in Karnataka politics. Uh, he was for many, many years in the state assembly. He made his way up in the state assembly. He won many, many elections over the course of something like 30 years uh, before moving to the, to the, to the, to the Lok Sabha. Uh, he's a Congress loyalist, he, which means that he is uh, known to be very loyal to the Nehru Gandhi dynasty. In fact, one of the little known facts about him is that he has five children and three of them are named after members of the Nehru Gandhi, uh, Gandhi dynasty. And so many people are framing this as a contest between the family's person, which would be Karge, and the flamboyant outsider who thinks who has, he has a shot, which would be Tharoor. And the prediction. Uh, is uh, fairly obviously that uh, Karge will win and Tharoor will lose precisely because Karge is seen to be have, have the blessings of the family. Uh, Sadan, can I just press you on this a little bit? I mean, do you think there's any uncertainty in this contest or do you think it's a kind of open and shut case? I don't think there's any uncertainty. Um, I will come back to Grant Tamasha and eat my hat should I be proven wrong. <laughs> uh, Tanvi, let, let me uh, t turn to you. This election uh, for the Congress party head takes place against the backdrop of this months-long yatra being led by Rahul Gandhi. It began way back on September 7th. Uh, in the southernmost tip of Tamil Nadu. It's going to cover something like 12 states and 3,500 kilometers, give or take. It'll eventually wrap up uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. What is the political significance, if any, of this endeavor that Rahul Gandhi is undertaking? I mean, I think it's too soon to tell its significance, right? Because at the end of the day, what we're going to we're going to see whether it's significant or not, if it especially if it doesn't just change the narrative, but it doesn't have any electoral effect at the end of the day, which is essentially kind of the Congress's problem at the moment. Having said that, I mean, it has clearly garnered some attention, including from the BJP, uh, which obviously seems to be spending some time uh, dismissing it. So obviously they think at least it is of, it is noteworthy. Um, but then they're also good at try, kind of trying to nip things in the bud sooner rather than later. Um, 
I mean, on the positive side, this is Rahul Gandhi spending time in the country, going across it, spending 150 days, which, you know, um, will maybe kind of, you know, help take on that criticism that he spends a lot of time abroad and, and takes off at, at key moments. Um, so I think, you know, this engaging in good old fashioned re retail politics is good. He's going to different states. Um, it might generate some enthusiasm amongst party carters. Um, having said that, you know, there, there are some questions about it, including specifically about the itinerary of and planning around the, the Yatra, um, you know, um, s several days in many states, but then only kind of, I think it's four or five in Uttar Pradesh, um, which is odd given its electoral significance uh, and the fact that it, it sends the maximum number of MPs to uh, the Lok Sabha. Um, and so, you know, that's an interesting choice. Um, and I kind of haven't really heard an explanation as to why. Um, but it also, the other questions are, you know, how is this connected to everything else that's going on, whether it's the Congress party election? So, you know, it goes to some things that I have mentioned, which is, you know, if if there is going to be an election with the Congress leader, then you have this other kind of yatra going on where you're saying, no, but really it is the family that is leading the party. And how is that connected? Is this going to resolve any of the problems that Congress has in terms of organization or helping the opposition parties coalesce together? And I don't quite see that yet. So I think the question is, this is fine in and of itself. It's good that they're raising kind of their issues and maybe generating enthusiasm. Um, but there are also questions about how it's related to kind of the broader goal of winning elections. You know, Sadan, and I want to go back to something that you uh, said on Twitter. You, in fact, had an entire Twitter thread I thought was, was very interesting. But it began with the following statement, which is, quote, people may wish Congress was not a family concern, but more than 50 years after Indira Gandhi split the party, it has no other viable identity or organizing principle. A non-Gandhi may become president, but real authority will continue to lie with the family, end quote. Um, why is it still, after all these years, impossible to imagine a Congress that does not have the family front and center? You know, I think one of the mistakes people make is that they think of the Congress like it's a normal political party. Right? They sort of liken it to, say, Labour or the Tories or the Christian Democrats or uh, and sort of take your pick of a, you know, a normal functioning political party in the West. Um you know, I think of it more as a little bit of, um, you know, I'm going to sort of, it's, 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 the analogy is less wild than it, uh, than it sounds at first blush, but I think of them more a bit like the Kardashians. It's an entertainment franchise that happens to be in politics. This particular franchise is connected to the family. It has been connected to the family ever since Indira Gandhi split the party in 1969. In fact, Congress used to be known for many years as Congress I, where I stood for Indira. And when you talk to people who've been in Congress for many years, just the way they talk about members of the family, right? So like, oh, well, why do you think Priyanka might have a future in Congress? Because haven't you seen when she sh turns her head and looks to the left, she looks so much like her grandmother. I mean, this is just how these people speak. Uh, this is how they think. Uh, it's not a surprise that they have uh, not had a powerful non-Gandhi president in 50 years, except, you know, briefly, uh, Nursa Marao was president, and he and he and he struggled. So we just have to accept the fact that this is the nature of this particular party. And as long as you have members of the family who are in active politics, that is where authority and power will naturally flow in the party, right? So, I mean, you mean to sort of come back to my Kardashian analogy? I mean, you may be somebody else, right, who sort of thinks that they have all the qualities it takes to be a, a great reality show contestant in that franchise. But as long as there's someone from the family around, it's just very hard to take that mantle. So for Shashi Tharoor, I think the problem is that he is, uh, you know, the right man in the wrong party. Uh, Tanvi, you want to come in on this? Yeah, I just, you know, something Sadan said, which is kind of nurse Mara struggle. I actually think the from the family's perspective, maybe it was that he didn't struggle enough, that he was actually successful in some ways. Um, you know, and, and that the concern always is that there'll be another nurse Mara um, who is actually, you know, has kind of, not kind of entirely independent, but has his own kind of stature and 
uh, makes people question, do you really need the family? Um, and so, you know, sometimes who's going to win the election? Whoever perhaps the family thinks is going to be the least independent of the of the candidates. And you have your answer, right? Uh, and so I think, you know, whether it was even Kalva Manmohan Singh, um, who, you know, stayed fairly close to the family, but made independent decisions and had, you know, most prominently for kind of those who follow U.S.-India relations on the nuclear deal. Uh, where he took an you know he took a view that was different um, from say Sonia Gandhi's view, uh, and so you know sometimes I think it's just a question of it's it's uh, it's not just that a, uh, somebody would, who's not non Gandhi will inherently struggle. It is partly that they have chosen people who are um, who are least likely uh, to be uh, kind of independent. Yeah, but the folks. fact that they have to do the choosing is the problem, right? I mean, like. I mean, that, that you should be able to take power in a political party. You should be able to oppose the family and take power in a political party, particularly when that party is doing as badly as Congress has been doing. But that doesn't seem possible. A selection rather than an election. Uh, l let me segue over to our second topic here, uh, because I think there's quite a lot to unpack. We saw External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar complete a pretty long and intense visit to the United States. He made stops at the UN General Assembly in New York. He, of course, did the whole tour of official Washington as well. I just want to read out an assessment of his trip and really of the broader relationship that Prashant Shah of HT put together, and we'll, we'll, we'll link to that in the show notes. It's a, it's a rather bullish assessment. Uh, Prashant writes, Jay Shankar's visit once again reaffirmed that India and the U.S. are deeply, closely engaged in their bilateral relationship about the wider regional challenges in the Indo-Pacific and about the state of the world. Like friends, the two countries talk, they agree, they find avenues to collaborate, they disagree and argue, sometimes loudly, often gently. But through all of this, the depth of their relationship grows. In a volatile world, that's good news for both country. Um, Thanvi, I was struck not just by this assessment, but a lot like this one, which were very upbeat in tone, uh, despite the fact that uh, you know, it wasn't always all uh, sunshine and light uh, in, in the meetings. Tell us a little bit about what you think this this visit uh, means. You're clearly reading different articles and have not been on Twitter enough because all I've been seeing is kind of people declaring yet another time uh, that the U.S.-India relation is about to die. Um, I think, you know, the, 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 the there's different aspects of this, which, you know, I think Prashant's article alludes to, which is, I don't think there's any doubt the U.S.-India relationship is closer today um, than it has ever been uh, before. Uh, and you see this reflected in just what's happening in the, this week, uh, forget kind of, you know, in even two weeks. Uh, and, you know, you have um, National Security Council, Indo-Pacific coordinator, Kurt Campbell in India with a, a, a pretty kind of hefty team. Um, uh, there for discussions of all sorts. You have uh, um, even kind of less heard of, but uh, I noticed it today, the Customs and Border Patrol and Homeland Security folks in India to talk to their colleagues about supply chain security issues and cargo security. Uh, you have, um, uh, you know, Petroleum and Natural Gas Minister Hardeep Puri here in the U.S. Uh, this week. Um, you have uh, India and the U.S. about to kind of embark on the 60th anniversary of the Sino-Indian War, a military exercise between their armies, which is, you know, what, 100 kilometers from the China-India border. Um, and, and you know, you have um, a, congressional, uh, a, a, sta a congressional staff delegation, right, you know, just today, um, being welcomed onto the INS Vikrant, India's kind of aircraft carrier. And to those who um, follow U.S.-India relations and the history of that, aircraft carriers have a special significance given, uh, you know, people often invoke the USS Enterprise and uh, and the, that as a sign of, you know, U.S. perfidy and uh, being anti-India and supporting Pakistan. So it's always kind of these moments are kind of interesting in that regard. Um, and so I don't th I, I think, you know, these things aren't happening because uh, they're happening because both sides see a mutually beneficial relationship and not just a deep relationship, but a broad relationship. Having said that, I don't think there's any kind of getting around the fact that they, you know, they are, uh, the, the, there's convergence on key issues. Uh, the countries are like-minded, but they're not same-minded on, on everything. And you see this particularly, um, and this was something that, you know, I noticed even historically when I looked at moments of U.S.-India convergence and kind of what went wrong. And sometimes it was just differences about their other partnerships. So what we've seen in the last kind of six months or so is, you know, 
India's partnership with Russia creating some friction. And more recently, you know, in the last couple of weeks, uh, the U.S. kind of trying to kind of reestablish or some normalize some sort of relationship with Pakistan uh, is is a problem for India. Um, and so I do think these partnerships have thrown up some di divergences, some differences. And the uh, uh, question is, you know, how do the countries manage these differences? And usually what history tells us is if the kind of strategic convergence in this case in the Indo-Pacific and on China is strong enough, they will make an active effort to manage or downplay these differences. Uh, that doesn't mean they go away, so they can come up at any time. But I do think it, it means kind of m trying to think about, you know, sensitivities of other countries. At the end of the day, the U.S. is going to do what's in its interest. India will do the same. But, you know, having kind of simple processes like no surprises, uh, make sure you actually, you know, engage on these issues uh, before, you know, people are yelling and screaming. And then strategic communications about these issues. So it's not people on Twitter that are setting uh, setting the communications around this. Uh, you know, Sadan and Thunvi, uh, the came back to the point of differences. And there were several notes of dissonance during this visit. There was a public forum in which the external affairs minister, you know, once again, dismissed the U.S. and foreign media essentially for peddling fake news about uh, India's domestic developments. Uh, both Jay Shankar and Blinken raised concerns about the quality of the other country's democracy in their joint press conference. Do these dissonant notes, particularly on the democratic front, do they add up to much in the final analysis? Well, it just depends on how you define final. Uh, do they add up to a lot right now? I don't think they do. Um, I think sort of if you you're going back to Thanvi's response, um, it's very clear that the U.S. and India have a deep relationship. It's very clear that they're cooperating um, across the board on many, many issues. And it seems that at least so far, they have managed to thread the differences they have, uh, most notably on Russia. Uh, and they both seem to be um, primarily focused or they're able to keep the relationship to a large extent focused on their common interest in the Indo-Pacific. So I don't think that um, the sort of what you're seeing in India in terms of the erosion of Indian liberal democracy, uh, whether it's at attacks on civil society, attacks on the media, uh, the the fact that the opposition is in disarray and in many ways, as you've written about, Milan, does not really have a level playing field. I don't think any of these are going to um, get in the way of um, the, the grand strategic convergence between the U.S. and India for now. Um, the question really is, what are the long-term implications? And there, I think that the worry or what should be a worry from an Indian perspective on this would be that to what degree can we see the kind of deterioration we've seen before it begins to matter? And would all other things being equal, would it be better if India's democracy was also in robust health? Um, I would argue that it clearly would be. And it's in, take sort of it's, it's overly cynical to, to point to the fact that the relationship is doing well despite some of these dem problems with democracy and then sort of to conclude from that that the problems with democracy uh, don't matter at all. Um, they do matter. Things would be, be better. But I think that those of us who are concerned about these democratic issues and write about them a lot have to acknowledge that in the end, at least at this moment in time, um, our particular concerns are not being reflected uh, in, 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 in a particularly dramatic way. Thunmi? Uh, just kind of s somewhat tongue-in-cheek on a kind of serious issue, but I, I do think next time Secretary of State Blinken is in India, he should complain uh, about the Indian media and social media's representation of the U.S., given its general tenor, which is negative. So, you know, there's a pitch for a policy recommendation since uh, since uh, we, we this has become a diplomatic issue now. Uh, Thanvi, you, you mentioned Russia-Ukraine, um, and we saw something that garnered quite a lot of press attention on the sidelines of the SCO gathering. Uh, Prime Minister Modi told the Russian president, that we don't live in a, quote, era of war. In some of his most pointed public remarks to date about the Russian invasion, this line, as you know, got a lot of attention in the global press. Uh, some cynics have basically said there's really nothing new in what Modi said or remarkable. What did you make of that statement that, that Modi uttered to Putin? 
So I'll preface this with, I, I, I've come to the conclusion that India's position on Russia, Ukraine has become a bit of a kind of, it's a Rorschach test. You see in it what you either want to see in it or, you know, what you're looking uh, looking for. And so, you know, I mean, I'm going to do, and you know, sometimes I'm criticized for it, but the kind of on the one hand or on the other hand, but I think one of the issues was that a lot of people in the West initially, and I think for several months, exaggerated the extent of Indian support for Russia. Um, and then, you know, when he made these comments at this meeting at the SCO with Putin, people then exaggerated, some people, I shouldn't say everybody, but some people kind of exaggerated saying, you know, this is pushback or that India was going to, gonna, um, uh, le you know, leave Russia or distance itself from Russia. And obviously that wasn't the case. And, you know, I think it was fairly predictable at the time. But you also see people... You know, other people, on the other hand, kind of saying, oh, this didn't matter at all, as you said, that it's exactly the same. And I don't think that's quite right either, because I think, you know, given Indian dependence uh, on Russia and the many reasons uh, it has actually not um, made such remarks publicly in this way. Now, it, it, I sh it should be said, this is the first time Modi was meeting Putin. So it's not like he had an opportunity before. And Indian readouts of their phone calls have repeatedly said that, you know, though in less stark language that, you know, India does not see any interest in this war continuing. Um, so I do think, you know, it is, it was significant uh, that he, that Prime Minister Modi did say this publicly. Uh, he not only, you know, this, er, this is not an era of war got attention, but the other thing he said is that Putin needed to, con and Russia needed to contribute to alleviating uh, and to helping resolve this food, fertilizer, and fuel um, security concerns that countries have. So putting the onus on him as well, not just saying we buy your line that it's everybody else's fault and not yours. Um, and I think this is significant because it was starker than what India said before. It was public, and he could have just punted and not said anything. Um, it was also kind of clear from Putin's remarks that he said, you know, you've been telling me this for a while. Uh, this wasn't the first time. Um, but I think it was also kind of interesting, the other stuff, right? We know Prime Minister Modi is a hugger. He made it a point to not hug uh, 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 President Putin. He also did not attend uh, the reception, the SCO reception the night before. Um, you know, it, you could also say that maybe he did that because he didn't want to be in the same frame or seen yucking it up with Xi Jinping, the Chinese uh, leader who was also there, but also then ended up skipping the liner. So I think, you know, there, there was consciousness. And so I think, you know, the one question has come, you know, why did Modi say this now? I think part of it is, as I said, this is the first time he's seeing it publicly. I do think there's, there's also this aspect where, um, you know, uh, to some extent, it's reflective of the fact that this Russian invasion of Ukraine, what, whether India says so publicly or not, has adversely affected several Indian interests. And the idea, especially with Putin promising to kind of escalate even further, whether that's through mobilization or potentially threatening, uh, you know, using nuclear threats, which India's, as it's quote unquote, been deeply disturbed about, um, this is uh, this is kind of opening the possibility. This is going to be this is going to continue. And for an India that's trying to kind of have you know economic recovery, get back, you know, focus on its China challenge, uh, this is hardly in its in, in its interest. Hey, Grant the Masha listeners. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Putting this show together each week is a labor of love, but it takes a lot of work to put out a great show every week. If you'd like to support the work we do at Grant the Masha, please visit ceip.org slash donate. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcasting platform, so you'll be the first to know when a new episode rolls out. Sadhanand, you want to comment on this? So let, let me take a slightly different and somewhat cynical view. Um, I thought this was excellent uh, and quite sort of shrewd political communication by Modi. But what he said, was, in fact, was a banality. He just said that this is not a time for war. I mean, who else, who, who would, who's going to say that it is a time for war? Um, and if you watch the rest of those comments, he also said the kinds of things that uh, were, that he would have predicted would be played up by the Russian media and, in fact, were. Things like he talked about his old friendship with Putin, and he talked about how he'd known him since he was a chief minister. They both talked about uh, uh, Modi's birthday coming up. So there was a lot of sort of that other kind of stuff, too. I think they rightly probably thought that most of the Western media was would run with the 
uh, line about it's not being a time for war. Um, I think what you have to keep your, your eye on are a couple of things that are, you know, that basically can't be glossed over and can't sort of be passed by use of clever language. Um, one is the votes in the UN. And just recently you had, the, you know, the I- India abstained instead of voting against the Russians on the incorporation of these four territories into, into Russia. Um, and then the other is oil sales. And there again, there's no, there are no signs that India is slowing down. It has, uh, it has very dramatically increased its purchase of Russian oil. Now, I'm saying both of these are justifiable from an Indian perspective. Um, but I think that those are really the concrete things that can't be fudged with by using language. And so I'd, I'd say that's what I'd keep my eye on. I don't think, you know, I don't think it's about fudging it, right? I think the, the fact is that they're competing imperatives. Uh, and sure, uh, did, did the kind of use of language give, uh, was it partly because I think India is also recognizing it isn't a cost-free approach to just, you know, upset all your partners that you're actually closest to and are doing something for you strategically and economically uh, in ways that Russia can't or won't? Uh, absolutely. So I do think it was a message. But having said that, you could also see kind of in uh, in India that is it's not just cynical. Right? India actually has very little. I can't think of one Indian interest that has actually been uh, where you know it's actually benefited from this war. Oh, I don't think India is being cynical. I'm saying my analysis of what that exchange was. was much I mean, more you're cynical always yours. cynical, so I'm I'm not saying no. you know that's not different. I'm just saying I mean to some extent it is cynical even on the part of India. Right, you, you want a message, but I'm saying it's not just cynical. I actually do think India India is interested in this war not kind of continuing uh, indefinitely. Uh, to the point, it's saying things like you know immediate cessation of hostilities, which if you know you're, you're Ukrainian, you're going to say absolutely not. But um, I don't think you know the Russian invasion has thrown several, as I've, I've said, you know uh, several Indian interests. Um, UN votes, absolutely. I don't think that part has changed, right? That I agree with those saying it's the same, which is because India's interests haven't changed overnight. The reasons it's abstained before are still the reasons it's uh, abstained. But one of the things we had said is, in fact, earlier we were saying, well, look, he's not willing to criticize him uh, publicly. So for the fact that India wasn't saying anything, the fact that this is not so I guess I think this is not a time for war does not qualify in my in my book as the top hundred criticisms. <laughs> well, well, you know, by Indian standards, it is, especially when it comes to sure. Russia, given that sure. India tiptoes around Russia, uh, it is uh, significant. You might think it's banal. Yeah, this is like the earlier point, right? Like, I mean, Rahul Gandhi is doing really well because he managed to sort of stay in India for <laughs> 50 days. Yay. See, but, okay, but, sure. But uh, it's a different benchmark. You know, this is where the difference between kind of political analysis and kind of when you sit and read enough MEA statements uh, and the fact it is significant any time India actually says boo to Russia because it never does, especially publicly. Um, so, yeah, I think we do have a difference uh, on this. Uh, but, yeah, I do. And... Look, I, the oil thing has always been clear, right? You see the ups and downs. Where it's a price, it's entirely price driven. August, India, I think it was August that India reduced its uh, its uh, imports from Russia because the price was higher. Um, September, it increased again because the price was lower. Now, this question of the price gaps is going to come up. Uh, it's still not clear what the Europeans are going to do. Uh, I suspect that's one of the things the petroleum minister will talk about. Um, but, you know, I think it was uh, maybe Shashank Joshi from The Economist who joked, you know, because Russia said to India, don't don't subscribe to the price caps. We'll give you even more discounted oil. We'll give you a greater discount. Well, that actually achieves the purpose, as Shashank said, so Russia is going to cap its own price to avoid for to avoid India subscribing to the price cap. In India's case, if that means cheaper oil, uh, that's good. And for the for Western countries who want Indi- to, Russia to sell at a lower price, so its profit margins are reduced, that's also good. So, so let us agree to disagree on this point, uh, but but perhaps there's more disagreement coming up. Let, let's talk a little bit about our third and last topic, which is the Indian diaspora. Uh, last month, we saw pretty worrying, I think, communal clashes between uh, Hindus and Muslims uh, in the city of Leicester in the United Kingdom. The origins of this violence still remain somewhat murky. We know that there were Hindu groups marching through a Muslim-dominated part of Leicester, chanting religious slogans. A Muslim mob allegedly then surrounded a Hindu temple, burned a saffron flag. There were scuffles between the two groups uh, across the city. Sadan, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, 
is this something new? Is this some kind of inflection point? Or is this just sort of part of a, a broader trend that's out there among the diaspora, this kind of religious or communal polarization? I think it's new in terms of its severity, right? I mean, you have had clashes in the diaspora earlier. You can always sort of go back to the 90s, for example, or the late 80s when Hindutva was rising in India, or go back even farther to the 1971 India-Pakistan war and the way that played out among um, immigrant families in, in, in the UK. So there have been tensions before. But what you've seen now in the era of social media is something quite uh, dramatically different in terms of scale. You have large mobs gathering on the streets of Leicester. Uh, you have these identity entrepreneurs on either side stoking uh, stoking uh, calls for retaliation with some pretty incendiary rhetoric. Uh, you have the fact that the middle ground has really disappeared. And if anyone tries to point out that, look, there were probably provocateurs on both sides, um, there's very little room for that message because what each side is trying to do is sort of look for a story that confirms that they are completely in the right and the other side is completely in the wrong. So a lot of that has happened, and I think a lot of that has, as, as, as many commentators have pointed out, a lot of this is um, the politics of uh, India being exported to the diaspora, which is inevitable. It is natural. We saw some of that in the U.S. You know, I remember, I think we, 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 we may have spoken about it on Grand Tamasha, uh, where you had a section of the community that was quite upset with uh, Kamala Harris's position on Kashmir, for instance. That became a big thing in India and then again re reverberated back with the diaspora. So I think that the, the, the distance between domestic politics and the politics of the diaspora has shrunk dramatically. I think that's, that's, that's fairly obvious. And to the degree that the politics in India has become more fraught, particularly on these identity and religious issues, uh, we're going to see this natural fallout. Um, hopefully, it won't always be um, as fraught or as bad as what we've seen in Leicester. But I think that the broad trend that Leicester represents uh, is with us to stay. Uh, Sanan, you talked about the importance of identity entrepreneurs. I, I just wanted to point out there was a kind of an interesting social media analysis, which looked at sort of thousands of tweets, which had kind of geotagged information associated with certain hashtags that went viral during this. And I think eight out of 10 tweets were geotagged to India, right? So only 6% actually were, were occurring in the, inside the UK, which just shows you that, you know, identity entrepreneurs aren't restricted to the streets of Leicester. They're obviously, you know, uh, operating on social media in, in, in the United States and in India and in, in other places as well. Yeah, and Indian news channels jumped into this too, right? It wasn't just the troll army, right? There were the Indian news channels paid a lot of attention to this. Uh, most of them, in my view, took a very one-sided view, the sort of, you know, the poor suffering Hindus being attacked by Muslims. Um, not to say that there wasn't some truth to that in certain, uh, you know, in certain, in certain places. But I just think that nobody was really looking to try and figure out what happened and try to sort of apportion blame um, fairly, if not evenly. Um, I think this, in, in India, this quickly became a sort of sensationalized story about the Hindus being under attack. And I think in England also, where you have a lot of, you know, you have groups like Hizbut Tahrir that are quite hardline and very well organized, they kind of use this as an opportunity to kind of whip up support. So yeah, so you have all you have these people all over, and you also have the Indian media, which has quite a large megaphone. Um, amplifying all of this. Uh, Thanvi, you know, Sadan talked about the one-sided response. The Indian High Commission in London condemned the violence, but in its statement only mentioned the, quote, vandalization of premises and symbols of the Hindu religion, end quote, even though there were a variety of videos out there uh, which showed that the Muslim community had also been attacked. Um, how concerned are you that these sorts of one-sided statements uh, will sort of damage the credibility of, of India's diplomats, right? Sort of career folks who are kind of, you know, in the trenches. I think, you know, to me, it's less so about the diplomats itself. It's about thinking about the implications for Indian foreign policy and the diaspora. And I think one of the questions, and this is not about one incident or the other, um, diaspora politics and relations with kind of mother country, so to speak, are always incredibly fraught. And for decades, India, which has, what is it, I think 13 million Indian citizens, but then kind of, you know, also an almost an equal number, maybe slightly less of 
um, people of Indian origin that it connects to. So, you know, the equivalent to those of not familiar NRIs, non-resident Indians, are those Indians who are abroad, who are still Indian citizens. And then PIOs or overseas citizens of India are people who are, say, you know, um, British uh, Indians or British citizens of Indian origin or Indian Americans, uh, American citizens of Indian origin. And it's they're complex because partly of this diversity, right? It's not just uh, Indian citizens abroad. It is, so, you know, the fact that the Indian government is... Uh, now weighing into an Indian government that is so particular about other countries not intervening in internal affairs, India's internal affairs, you know, commenting on an issue uh, which involves, I mean, we don't know who were Indian passport holders and not, but, you know, non-Indian citizens in places. Now, the, the line saying that, you know, these are this is kind of a Hindu minority and that's why, but again, this you know this this is going to be raise some really kind of fraught questions involved trade offs um, and this question of you know uh, uh, how do you balance kind of domestic imperatives or domestic political imperatives um, with foreign policy or even your diaspora security uh, imperatives and the reason I say that is because you know these kind of things have the potential of negatively affecting. Uh, India's uh, foreign policy relations or ties with the countries, um, whether it's, you know, Britain, Canada, US, Australia, where there are these large diasporas. We saw this, I mean, and we discussed this on Grand Tamasha, uh, of, you know, uh, kind of in the Middle East uh, and how, you know, not even the diaspora, but kind of some of the spillover of Indian domestic politics can really start to tie the hands of uh, those countries um, and shape the way they're, they're thinking about India um, and, and this becoming a friction point, um, which is kind of diaspora politics. There's also the kind of, uh, there is also this kind of idea, I think that you're going to see, and I think Sadan uh, you know, talked about this in some ways, it's natural. We've seen a more div divided diaspora. Uh, a more united diaspora used to be kind of, you know, it was seen as a strength in India. But, the, you know, we are going to see whether that is across faith lines, whether that's across ethnicities, whether that's, and Milan, some of your polling has shown generational divides. Or, you know, are you kind of a, a new immigrant or have you been here? Ages? So I think you're just going to see a more divided diaspora. What does that mean for kind of uh, India's relations with these countries or with the diaspora and whether the diaspora represents as much of an asset um, as it did in the past. Um, I think there's also this question of, you know, the, the what this does to the status of Indians and um, people of Indian origin in these countries. Does it start to make them targets uh, if they are seen as kind of representing Others, at the end of the day, Indians are and Indian Americans are minorities in almost every country they are uh, abroad. And so, you know, it, it, this idea of, you know, when you're, when you're saying something about minority or treatment of minorities uh, that is different, uh, or you're saying only choosing one group, I think this becomes an issue. I think the second thing, and we've seen this, you know, in uh, the U.S., uh, interestingly, which where you saw the right wing in the U.S., including people who had served in the Trump administration, uh, point to Lester and say, look, this is why we should not have brown people immigrate to the U.S. Um, so, you know, it's becoming part of this kind of larger narrative and targeting Indian Americans and Indians in the U.S. in this case. Um, and so I think, you know, these are issues that need to be thought about. Uh, Sadan, so you know, uh, thinking about the United States for a second, we've seen debates over caste break out in California in a, in a variety of different contexts. We had the recent incident of a, of a bulldozer. Some people clarified that it was actually a backhoe, not a bulldozer, appear in an Independence Day parade in Edison, New Jersey, which, of course, has a certain kind of symbolism given what's what's happened in India. Um just coming back to Thunby's points, do you think that these kinds of cleavages will stymie the diaspora's ability to sort of, you know, translate its its pretty rapid demographic growth into political power, right? Because there's certainly a lot of talk about, you know, how this is such a uh, fast growing community, uh, how it's kind of gone from strength to strength. Is this something that's going to inhibit its ability to really exercise kind of muscle power in the political realm? Well, first, I think, you know, for your listeners, I'm not sure they'd be sort of aware of what the thing about the backhoe or the bulldozer is. I mean, basically, these were used in Uttar Pradesh, which is run by a hardline uh, Hindu fanatical monk 
Uh, the bulldozers were used to destroy Muslim property when Muslims were seen as protesting. So obviously, this has been a big sort of human rights issue. That's why uh, it was controversial when this showed up in an Indian parade in uh, New Jersey. Um, to answer your question, Milan, I think, yes, um, obviously, uh, it affects the coherence of the Indian American community and the cohesiveness. Uh, I'm not sure that in itself is a bad thing, I have to say. I, I think that I'm, I'm sort of, I, I think it's, uh, it's not only natural, but it's good for the Indian American community to reflect a multiplicity of views. And I think the fact that they've been pretty much lockstep uh, with one political party in the U.S. is not necessarily uh, something that's particularly good for the community. I think we've already seen in the U.K., that it's just much more divided. You have many Indians who, you know, are lean towards labor. Even your research has shown this, um, and um, many more than in the past are now voting for the conservatives. But ideally, those divisions, uh, which I think are healthy and and are and are good, um, would reflect a contest of ideas. But what we seem to be seeing now instead is those divisions reflecting primordial identities. Uh, we saw some of this happen, in fact, uh, not linked to Hindutva directly, but we saw some of this happen with the farm law protests in Canada, in the U.S., and other parts of the West, where in many ways they became a kind of uh, Sikh issue, even though it was actually an economic issue. I mean, you saw, had sort of this strange, uh, you know, you had um, professors of religion writing about this on CNN. Um, the whole thing was sort of, you know, filtered, began to be filtered through the prism of this kind of identitarian uh, mobilization. So we've, 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 it's been happening for a while. Um, it's going to intensify because, you know, coming back to the sort of earlier question, what's, what's, what's happening is that Indian politics itself is kind of being organized uh, increasingly on, along those lines. The old liberal consensus is uh, has basically um, uh, on, on its last legs, in my view. And that's how it's going to play out. So I would say that, uh, I know, ideally we would have many more and interesting debates I mean, in, among the diaspora about what should be the sort of Indian view, for example, the Indian American view of pick an issue, say affirmative action. You can have a really interesting debate, um, but unfortunately it looks like uh, the spillover from India means that the kinds of debates people are going to have, at least for now, or seem to be having, are much more based on what, you know, uh, what people's caste is or what their religion is or where they stand on um, on, on religious politics, which is unfortunate. So guys, we've covered a lot of ground, domestic politics in India, foreign policy, diaspora. Before we wrap up, um, I haven't seen you both in, in some time. Uh, it's been many months. Uh, and I'm wondering if there is one recommendation you'd like to leave with our listeners of the sort of best thing you've read on India in these intervening months. Thunby, let me start with you. Is there something that comes to mind as, as, as a central reading for our listeners? Uh, so I think there's been so much kind of coming out, and I, I feel bad about identifying one thing. So one of the one of the really good um, uh, books I've been reading is a, a new book by Dr. Jayata Sarkar called Plowshares and Swords: India's Nuclear Program in the Global Cold War. Um, and you know, for me, a, a the kind of a, a good book is one that's well written, but also that I learned something that I didn't know before. Um, and it, you really do see this kind of uh, lots of archival work around the world. And it's kind of part of this new generation of if, work on Indian foreign policy that is really kind of going back and reinterpreting things we thought we knew. And in this case, about an issue kind of nuclear policy, it's never quite gone away. But, um, you know, it adds a lot to even the debate about India's choices vis-a-vis uh, -vis its both its civilian and um, uh, civilian nuclear program and its nuclear weapons program. And it has some kind of interesting personalities like Homi Bhabha, Vikram Sarabhai, Nehru, of course. Um, and so, you know, I just think it's an interesting uh, book, uh, very meaty, and um, throws up some kind of interesting questions uh, for the for the debate uh, today. And maybe, uh, Milan, you should have Jaita on uh, that, a, Grand Samash. Very, very more, right? good plug, uh, Tanvi Sadanan. Well, I was going to give you a one-line answer, but then after Tan Tanvi, like, well, sort of... <laughs> <laughs> Actually <laughs> prepared and thought about it, yes. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe I'm going to have to give you a slightly longer longer version, too. Um, <laughs> no, no, first, give us the, give us the one-liner so we know what you were so going to say. I, you know, Ashu Varshney, our friend, Professor Ashutosh Varshney at Brown, uh, has a chapter on Indian democracy in this new book about democracy in hard places. 
and he talks about the paradox of Indian uh, democratic longevity. Um, how is it that a country that was the first country in the world to adopt universal suffrage before it had universal literacy uh, has managed to be a democracy for so long? And he looks at a lot of the sort of uh, illiberalism um, that has uh, developed particularly over the past eight years. And he also looks at some of the you know, founding debates and um, you know, you should, people should read it themselves. But I think that sort of if I had to sum it up, you know, he, would, he would point out that some of the illiberalism was baked in the cake. It was sort of started off very early. That, um, and then he also makes the point that Indian liberalism was an elite-driven project. Uh, the people who wrote the Constitution were elites. These are not sort of mass politicians. And so um, now you have an ideology in power that is uh, fundamentally uncomfortable with a lot of those liberal values. And so it should not be surprising that they have come under the kind of pressure they've come under. But it's certainly worth reading. So I'm going to recommend something that is very self-referential because it's uh, a, a, a guest I had on Grantham Mosh a couple weeks ago. Mansi Choksi has this really terrific new book called The Newlyweds, which traces these three sort of taboo relationships across sort of tier two and tier three India. And it's it's part of this new literature uh, of of this incredibly well-reported nonfiction um, uh, that's, it's, it's reminds me a lot of Snigdha Poonam's book, Dreamers, uh, Shreyana Bhattacharya has elements of this, uh, in her book, uh, on, on Shah Rukh Khan, uh, and, and Sonia Falero's, uh, The Good Girls also very similarly. And, and it, what, what struck me is as a political scientist reading these four books. What are the taboos, Millen? The taboos are basically an intercaste, uh, relationship. An inter-community one between a, a Hindu uh, and a Muslim, uh, a Hindu woman and a Muslim man, and a same-sex uh, lesbian couple. Um, and what's so great about the book is that it's taking place in you know small villages and towns on the Telangana Maharashtra border, right? I mean, these are not stories of Bangalore and Delhi and Mumbai, and so it just tells you a little bit about the churning that's taking place you know, where, frankly, most of the people actually live, right, which is not in those big metros. So um, so we'll link to that, uh, to, to, to the book and, and, and to the pod with her. But I thought uh, it, it's it's really worth worth reading. My guests on the show, as always, are Thanvi Madan of the Brookings Institution and Zidane and Dume of AEI and the Wall Street Journal. Guys, it was really good to, to have you back. And let's do this uh, before too long. Good to be back. Great to be back. Grant Masha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you download your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review to help others find the show. Tim Martin is our audio engineer and Cliff Jayapranada is our executive producer. Production assistance comes from Nitya Love. Thanks for listening and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.